Because, you know, love goes above and beyond. That's going to take a few more of us. <laughs> <laughs> you can pick. So, so um, when Bob Goff opens his book with Love Does, he opens with chapter one. It's a chapter called I'm With You. Some of you have read it, some haven't. Um, but he tells of a time when he was a junior in high school. And he was kind of wayward and aimless. He, he really didn't, he wasn't doing well in school. And so he thought to himself, I have... I have maybe a better plan for my life. I think what I'm going to do is just leave school and I'm going to go to Yosemite and just climb cliffs all day. That was his plan, basically. He had $75, he had two bandanas, he had, I think, some kind of vest and some climbing shoes, and that was it. And so just before he, he leaves, he goes by a friend's house, Randy, who had been sort of a mentor to him. Randy worked with the organization, and he had been investing in Bob. And so before Bob just checked out, he wanted to go by his house and just say thank you. And so he goes by Randy's house, and um, he explains what he's doing. And Randy sort of listens to all of this. And rather than lecture him and, or tell him he's young and stupid, you know, what are you thinking kind of thing, he says, um, could you hold on for just a minute, Bob? And he said, sure. So Bob's standing in the doorway of his home. He goes back into a room, and a few minutes later, he comes back with a, a sleeping bag and a backpack. And he says, hey, hey, Bob, do you mind if I join you? And it takes him, it startles him a little bit, it takes him off guard, and he's like, okay. He said, once you go and get settled, I'll find my way back. No problem. Don't worry about me. I just want to go and make sure everything works out okay for you. So they go. They get there, and Bob realizes very early on that, like, it's going to take a little bit more than $75, two red bandanas, a vest, and some climbing shoes. And so he goes, and he's looking for a job, and, and place after place where he puts his application in, he just has no luck. He strikes out one place after another after another. And finally, he gets to a point where after a few days, the $75 has run out. He has no education. He has no money. He has no place to stay. His plan isn't working out quite like, it, like he envisioned it might. And how many of us have ever been in a place where we have this idea or vision or plan for reality and it just doesn't turn out the way you want it? So swallowing his pride, he tells Randy, hey, I, I think maybe, maybe this wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I think maybe we need to just go back. And so does anybody remember, if you've read the chapter, what, what Randy says to him? He says, Bob, whatever you do, whether you stay or whether you go, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. And so they drive back a rather long five, six hours, and it's quiet. Bob talks about how his dream had checked into hospice and how Randy was sensitive to the fact, and so he just quietly rode back with him, occasionally asking how he was doing. When they get back to Randy's house, Bob notices that that Randy's girlfriend's car is in his driveway. And he doesn't quite know what to make of it, but he goes in right behind Randy. And I just want to read to you a section that ends chapter 1 that will set the stage for what I want to talk with you about. So he goes in, and this is what he discovers. On the floor, I noticed a stack of plates and some wrapping paper, a coffee maker, some glasses, on the couch, there was a microwave half in a box. I didn't understand at first. Had Randy just had a birthday? Was it his girlfriend's? A microwave seemed like a weird way to celebrate someone's arrival into the world. I knew Randy wasn't moving because there wouldn't be wrapping paper. Then from around the corner, the other half of this couple bounded out and threw her arms around Randy. Welcome home, honey. And then the nickel dropped. I felt both sick and choked up in an instant. I realized that these were wedding presents that were on the floor. 
Randy and his girlfriend had actually just gotten married. When I had knocked on Randy's door on that Sunday morning, Randy didn't see just a high school kid who had disrupted the beginning of his marriage. He saw a kid who was about to jump the tracks. And instead of spending the early days of marriage with his bride, he spent it with me, sneaking into the back of a tent. Why? It was because Randy loved me. He saw the need and he did something about it. He didn't just say that he was for me or with me. He was actually present with me. And what I learned from Randy changed my view permanently about what it meant to have a friendship with Jesus. I learned that faith isn't just about knowing all the right stuff or obeying a list of rules. It's something more. Something more costly because it involves being present and making a sacrifice. Perhaps that's why Jesus is sometimes called Emmanuel, God with us. I think that's what God had in mind for Jesus to be present, not just to be with us. It's also what he had in mind for us when it comes to others. The world can make you think that love can be picked up at a garage sale or enveloped in a Hallmark card, but the kind of love that God created and demonstrated is a costly one because it involves sacrifice and presence. It's a love that operates more like sign language than being spoken outright. What I learned from Randy about the brand of love Jesus offers is that it's more about presence than undertaking a project. It's a brand of love that doesn't just think about good things or agree with them or even talk about them. What I learned from Randy reinforced the simple truth that continues to weave itself into the tapestry of every great love story, and that is, love does. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. We're going to be talking this week about how love goes above and beyond. And what I'm trying to do over the course of these eight weeks that I'm going to be teaching this series is I'm wanting to expand your imagination about what love looks like. Because I think more often than not, we settle for lesser versions of this word. Love is incredibly powerful, but it also involves when being given, it involves a level of sacrifice and surrender and even death to ourselves. That's what's imaged in the cross of Christ. That he loved us so much that he gave us completely himself. He surrendered his life so that we might know life to the full. And how could we follow one if that would not then be expected of us to follow in the same manner? That, that's the expectation. That when we love each other, there is some place of death on our part that has to occur. And so this morning I want to talk about what it means to go above and beyond now in the second story that I'm going to tell you, I just told you the first from chapter 1, the second story is equally, if not more profound and powerful for us. It comes from Mark chapter 2, and it is the fifth of ten consecutive healings that happen. Mark opens up and he goes right to work talking about the life and ministry of Jesus, and one by one by one he introduces us to a series of these <coughs> miracles and healings that happen. The one that we're going to look at today is number five. It's right in the middle. Jesus has been um, teaching and preaching and healing. And great crowds are starting to follow him. And his home base is not in Jerusalem. It's in Capernaum. It's in northern Galilee. Okay, And so he's making his way back to sort of what is home base. And he's tired because every day he's giving his life away. He's pouring himself out for the sake of others. And so all he wants to do is come back and get a little rest, but that's the last thing that's going to happen. Because when he arrives at the place that he'll be staying, there's such a mass of humanity both in and outside of his home that he can hardly even get in himself. Why? Because people want a piece of what he has to give. They want something from him. 
and he's going to deliver. But I want you to think about, just before we look at the text, I want you to think about what it is that you need today. The place of healing that most needs to transpire in you. We have spent the first part of our worship service singing and praying and opening ourselves to the healing presence of Christ. He is here. He is with us. And as we open his word, now there's an opportunity for you to be presented to him in the place where you most need to be met. And I think it's probable that some level of healing will happen to you today. Where is it that you need to be made well? And it's that place that I want you to open. It's that place that I want you to, to dare risk to be vulnerable with God in that space. Because I know that as much as you're in touch with that place, that God is even more in touch. He is appointed for you to be here today. And he wanted you to be here for a great purpose. And it's very possible that that purpose is to have him meet you in that space that you most need to be met. And to experience healing or deliverance or salvation or wholeness. Some of you think that probably isn't possible with the level of damage that exists inside of you. I think it's more than possible. And you're going to see that from the story. And I'm going to invite you to enter into that story because this story is yours. Okay? So before we read from Mark chapter 2, let's pray together. And as we pray, I just want you to quietly open to God and ask Him to meet you and to heal you where you most need it. Okay? So let's pray. Lord, today may we discover what above and beyond love looks like and feels like. May it take root in the deepest places of our need. And may it begin to heal and save and deliver us from darkness, from sickness, from addiction, from suffering from our pains. We open to you as best we can and we invite you to meet us here. In the healing name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 2 beginning with verse 1. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. And then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. So Jesus has a reputation. And his reputation is for one who has power and authority and healing. And if you live in and around that area, who wouldn't show up if you felt like you had somebody in your family who had cancer? Right? Heart disease. MS. Right? If in your mind or in your body you were bipolar or schizophrenic, you had something going on inside of you that wasn't right, wasn't as it should be. You were addicted to something that was stronger than you. Imagine the need of the people who were coming because they wanted to be well. And put a face on that. Maybe put your own face on that. Because in many ways, all of us have brokenness that needs to be made well and whole, don't we? So there are people of every variety and stripe who have come to hear Jesus, to see Jesus, and to be touched by Jesus 
because they want to be well. So the whole place is flooded out. You can't get in or out. The handicapped spots, they're taken too. <laughs> right? And these four guys show up and they're late and they're kicking themselves because they're thinking, we just should have gotten here sooner. Because now our friend who's on this mat, he's, Jesus is so close, but he's so far away and they, they don't know what to do. And then one of them gets this crazy idea, hey, we can't go through the front door or the back door, but there's a side entrance up onto the roof. Let's go onto the roof. Now, I don't know whether you've ever had to carry anyone before. I remember when we were doing baptisms when we used to have a tank back there. And there were steps that go up and steps that go down. It was very narrow. And Larry Gibson, many of you know Larry, wanted to be baptized. And there were four of us who were carrying him up the steps and down the steps. And he could not help himself. He was dead weight. It was one of the heavier loads that I've had to carry before, right? So, and I'm going up maybe, you know, four, five, six steps down, four, five, six steps. They're going up to a roof. How, how does that work, right? How, how do you get the guy up the steps and onto the roof? How does that work? They're going above and beyond because they want their friend to be well, and there are obstacles in their way. Lesser men would have just said, you know, let's just catch him at the next stop, right? And gone home. But one of them in the group thought, let's just go up to the roof. And they're like, the roof? What are we going to do on the roof? And he's like, you'll see, right? So they get up to the roof, and maybe one of them's a contractor, who knows, but they start installing like a skylight, right? They're digging through the mud, thatched roof, right? And they see some space in the cross beams. But imagine if you're Jesus, and you're inside the house, and you're the owner of the house at this point, right? Stuff's falling from the sky onto your head and in your eyes. This is definitely going to interrupt his sermon, right? So... Some people are afraid, some people are annoyed, some people have no idea what's going on, they think the thing is going to cave in. What would you think if you're standing in the house, listening to Jesus, and all of a sudden the roof starts to fall in? It'd be like yelling fire or something in there, right? So they are committed, though. They're digging a hole because they want to lower their friend, and as... As sort of the dust clears and Jesus looks up at the light now that's coming down through the hole in the roof, he sees a sense of desperation. Right? Only desperate men would climb a roof and cut a hole in somebody's roof, right? He sees desperation, but he sees more than desperation. He sees faith. And this faith is powerful. This faith is actually what's going to help heal this man. Their commitment, their belief, their desire to bring him into the healing presence of Christ is what, what's going to ultimately heal him. Now, I just want you, as you enter into the story, imagine what it's like to be the guy on the mat. Okay? Your friends are great and everything, and they've gone to great lengths to take you up to the roof, but now they've got to lower you. Are you nervous at all? I mean, how do you lower this guy from the roof down to the floor without possibly tipping him over or him falling and getting some kind of concussion? Or Who, who knows? Are you nervous if you're the friend? Or are you expectant? Are you thinking to yourself, what else do I have to lose? Really, honestly, what do I have to lose? I've been stuck on this six foot by three foot mat almost my entire life. I don't get out. I can't bathe for myself. I can't feed myself. I can't do anything for myself. 
So now I've got to determine whether or not I'm going to put my trust in my friends and in the one who I'm being lowered in front of or whether I'm going to say, hey, guys, let's not, let's, this was a great idea. I, you know, it's like getting to the diving board and then standing on the front and looking at it and saying, I think I'm going to go back down. I'm nervous a little bit if I'm him. Right? He doesn't know how the people are going to receive him, right? I mean, everybody else who's in that room probably waited a long time to get to Jesus, right? You think they're going to be happy that he cuts in front of the line? Do you like it when people cut in front of the line in front of you? All sorts of things going through the guy's head, I'm sure. But Jesus sees these four men... And he sees their determination and he sees their faith. And as they lower their friend in front of him, listen to what he says. It's strange, actually. Sort of. Verse 5. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. That's not why he came. <laughs> right? He didn't come to have his sins forgiven. He came to have his legs strengthened so he could walk. And by the way, what kind of sins could this guy be doing? <laughs> I mean, seriously. He's confined to a six foot by three foot mat. Oftentimes when we think of sin or those things that separate us from God, we we have pictures in our mind of what that looks like, right? And so we think to ourselves, what could this man possibly need to be forgiven of? And if you think a little bit about it, maybe resentment. Maybe anger. Maybe jealousy, maybe bitterness. Because when he was growing up and all his friends could do all these super cool things, he had to just sit and watch them. He had to just watch life pass him by. Because he didn't have what everybody else had. And maybe, maybe he had some bitterness. Maybe he was angry. You know, sin is anything that separates us from God. Do you know that bitterness and jealousy and resentment and anger that that separates us from God? Do you know that? Even if it isn't like one of your top ten sins, still, still does the job pretty well. And so when he speaks to the man and forgives his sin, I think Jesus knew that what was most important is that healing has to come from the inside out. He needed grace and mercy to heal those things that had trapped him in a prison. His friends and he wanted new legs, but Jesus wanted to give him a new life. You know that sometimes it doesn't matter the space we're confined in, that if our heart is right with God, we can be alive. We can be whole. We can be well. But we can have our legs, and we can walk and run and jump and still be in prison because of the things that bind us in our minds. <coughs> Jesus saw that he couldn't walk. He saw his crippled frame. But he saw what was more important was that he needed to get to his heart and to his mind and to release him from his sin that had trapped him. And then once that was done, walking's no problem. Walking's the least of his issues. It's going to come. But Jesus says, you need my grace, you need my mercy, you need my forgiveness, you need my release more than you need. 
So you would think everybody would be happy for the dude because he's going to pick up his mat and jump up and run away and they're going to think to themselves, okay, ne next, I'm next, me, next, right? Because if there's healing for him, this guy who hadn't been able to walk and there's forgiveness of his sin, maybe there's something for me. Here we go. But not everybody's so happy. Why is it that when good things happen to some people, not everybody is always so happy? It's the sin that separates us from God. We should be one another's champions. Constantly excited when God pours out grace goodness on other people. We should be happier for them than we are ourselves because it sets us free in the process too. But more often than not, we're like, you ever seen crabs in a bucket as one's trying to climb to the top, the others are just trying to pull them down? Crabology, that's... That's what we are a lot of times, right? It's true, you laugh because you know it's true. It's true. Now, listen to how the story finishes. Verse 6. But some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sin. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. Isn't that something? They don't even have to say anything. He like reads their thoughts and outs them. Man, that is something. Like, like we think we can hide stuff, right? You're like, you can't hide that. I see what's going on here. They're like, no. He reads their thoughts. He knows what's going on inside of them. And a good thing to do right here would be repentance, but that isn't what happens. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed, and they praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. Shame on them, man. They knew the law inside and out. They were strict interpreters of the biblical scriptures. They took it very, very seriously. But they were so much more devoted to the law than they were to the humanity that needed the mercy and compassion that God offers, that they couldn't even see it. They couldn't even be happy for this man who'd spent his life on a six-foot by three-foot mat. How could you miss that? His sin was being forgiven. And his legs were being strengthened. And most everybody else could see it except the religious folk. It was the religious people who couldn't see it. How's that possible? You know that's possible, don't you? I think, as I look at and I think about this, they possess zero faith. They know all the right things. They've memorized large portions of Scripture, but they have no faith. None. Zero. But then you contrast that with the four friends who basically took this guy up the steps to the roof, cut a hole in the roof, and lowered him. And I don't know whether you notice it or not, but usually when Jesus heals people, he heals people based on their expression of faith. He needs, there's some reason that need to open to that, right? He doesn't just do it. He wants to know, perhaps because he wants to lead them from that place to a new way of life, and that's going to involve some faith. So there has to be a little faith involved. And mostly, in the stories that we read about, it's the faith of the individual who is needing something. But in this case, 
It's the faith of his friends. Do you know how much power a friend with a little faith can have in someone's life? One or two or three or four. Do you know how much power that can have in someone's life? These guys had little to no faith. But the four had a great deal of faith, and as a result, a healing, a miracle transpired. And I, I just, I can't help when I get to the end of this story thinking to myself, when's the last time I went up on a roof and cut it open and crashed through to bring somebody into the healing presence of Christ because I was so desperate for something to transpire in them and in their life. When's the last time I was newly married and I left my wife because I saw my friend getting ready to shipwreck his life and he was totally lost. When's the last time I made the kind of sacrifice and told that person, you know what, whether you fail or you succeed, I'm with you. These are stories of people who express love in ways that are above and beyond what is normal. So often in our lives, we live lives and we give out love to the degree that we think we have it or that we can. It's so measured. And more often than not, we withhold more than we give. But with God, there's an endless supply. Which means I can freely give away all of it in an ongoing way because I know that as I open to that love, that I'm going to be refilled in an ongoing way and have everything I need to get me through my day. So I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be stingy. I don't have to live from a place of lack. I can live from a place of generosity because I know that the kind of love that was given to me was poured out completely so that I might know life and life to the full. I don't have to be sick in my body and in my mind. And my friends don't either. Listen, a lot of mystery to life. There are things that happen to us that are beyond our explanation. And sometimes we just won't get some of the troubles that we have to walk through and deal with. I get it. Not everybody on this side of eternity will be made well. Okay? That being said, a little bit of faith and a little bit of perseverance on behalf of someone else will go a long way towards seeing life and life to the full. And I think we just stop too short. I think our conception of love is too limited. I'm not asking you to compare yourself with Bob Goff as you read this book. I'm asking you to expand your imagination and your creativity when it comes to looking at your life and looking at those around you and considering what it might look like for you to go above and beyond in how you love other people. Because that's what love does. Love goes above and beyond. And so what I'm wanting you to do this week is I'm wanting you to think about what it would look like for that kind of love to come from you. Because that kind of love initiates healing. That kind of love initiates breakthrough. That kind of love is so powerful, it's so forceful, it breaks bondages. It loosens us to be free, to be the people that God made us to be. And to stop being so stingy with our own and stop being so selfish about what others get. That we can celebrate when we see good things happen to those around us. Even if we're not experiencing that in the moment ourselves. Because the moment we began to celebrate that in other people, it perhaps could be the beginning of release in us. 
when we're close-fisted and stingy, what is there to pour into our hands and our hearts? We have to live with a posture of openness so that we can be receptive to all that God wants to bring. When's the last time that you crashed through roofs to bring somebody into the healing presence of Christ? Desperation. Faith. Do you know how much just a little bit of faith can do in the life of an individual? You know, there are people in your world that are flagging in their faith these days because their road has been long and troublesome and burdensome and they can't see two feet in front of them. And sometimes what needs to happen when you can't see in front of you, you need somebody to pick up the mat and take them the next step of the journey to get them to the place be they can't do themselves. When's the last time you picked up somebody's mat and took them to the place that they needed to be? Not looking for congratulations or applause or pats on your back, but simply because you were desperate for them to find healing and deliverance and renewal in life. You say, well, I don't have anybody like that in my life. Sometimes you have to show yourself friendly before you can have a friend who will do that for you. I can guarantee you, if that's the kind of life that you live and the kind of love you give, you're going to have a lot of friends. When you have above and beyond kind of love, that's the kind of people I want to be around. Right? I, I want that Porsche in my driveway. <laughs> above and beyond kind of love. We, we don't want to be with stingy people. Sad, sour people who are stuck on how bad their life is and how their dreams didn't work out. That's death to everybody. Those are the people we tend to avoid, right? So we might not have those people and that might not have been done to us, although I, I would think probably if you would look back over the course of your life, there's somebody who's been a stretcher bearer for you. Maybe this week you could just stop and say thank you for that time where they took you and brought you through until you could get up on your own legs and start walking. But maybe, maybe the story speaks to us about how we need to be that person for somebody else. Because I have personally found when I stop looking at my own stuff long enough and I contribute to the life of another, it helps bring healing in me. Love sacrifices, it surrenders, it causes us to go to a place where we have to die to ourselves. And as we do that, we become just like the one who died for us. Become just like Christ. And after all, that's who we want to be, right? We're Christ followers. That's the model. And so I want to challenge you this week to imagine, to be creative in the ways that you're going to cut through roofs and you're going to lift up stretchers and you're going to carry people into the healing presence of Christ. Because I can guarantee you there have been times in our lives up to this point, now and in the days to come, where all of us will need that. And perhaps the person that we're carrying will someday carry us from a place of gratitude knowing that they couldn't have gotten to that space if it wasn't for a little bit of faith and some extra above and beyond perseverance. Those are the two stories you've heard. Now it's your turn. You get to live your story. What's it going to be? Stingy? Selfish? Greedy? Unhappy? or open, humble, willing, faithful, generous, above and beyond. That's what I invite you into. If you can't get to here, just take one step in the direction. I'm not asking you to go from A to Z. I'm just asking you to go A to B. When you get to B, I can go to C too.
I can't do it all overnight, but with God's grace and His help, I'm going to grow to be more loving. By the time we hit the end of this series, you're not even going to recognize me. I'm going to be a different person. It really can happen like that. Eight weeks is nothing with God. Eight weeks is nothing. I mean, in a moment, in a moment, this guy's life was changed. In a moment. Yours can be too. I mean, your life is really... That's what the scriptures teach us. Our lives are no different in that respect. God's power, his healing, his authority, his, it's the same. So let us expand our imagination and creativity and openness to the love of God. Sometimes the way towards receiving the love that we most want comes through giving it first. Don't keep score. Don't lose heart. There's enough love that if you continue to give it, God is going to honor and bless and fill you with more. And you're going to become more attractive to the people around you, and they're going to want to be more generous to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> right? We all need that. We all want that. And when we have it, it leads us to life and life more abundant. Let's pray. Lord, we are inspired by Randy and we are inspired by the four and by the faith of friends to bring others into a place that they need to be. And we opened our hearts this morning and we invited you to meet us at the place where we most needed it. And I ask God, as we move towards closing now, that as you meet us, you would help us to be honest in that space with you and allow you to continue from this space to the next to lead us and guide us and prompt us and empower us and give us the courage we need to take what is the next step and where you want us to be. And as we do in advance, because I know you're faithful, we'll give you thanks for the life you give us and the life that is to come. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.